All right, welcome everyone uh, to today's Expert Online series. This is uh, today's topic, uh, speech and language production of bilingual children with cochlear implants. Uh, we will go over some highlights that uh, we have discovered in the literature over the years and um, discuss some practical clinical implications with our guest speakers today. Uh, a few tips for yourselves, if you would uh, please name yourself and your organization, um, as well as the country, uh, you can click on your name in the participants panel and then click on more and rename. And if you would please uh, try your best to avoid background noise, you can mute your microphone. Um, and, uh, and if you do not speak, um, um, uh, and then mute your phone. Uh, we will have time for a question and answer where you are welcome to unmute yourself and pose your question later in the presentation. If you need a more stable internet connection, uh, we recommend to close all the programs on your device so the attention can be brought to Zoom. We have closed captioning available. And so if you are um, needing closed caption, you can um, look on the bottom ribbon of your screen and indicate uh, click on closed caption and select your language. And like I said, today's uh, topic is speech and language um, for uh, bilingual children with cochlear implants, highlights and clinical implications. My name is Michael Douglas. I am a speech language pathologist and certified auditory verbal therapist. I am a consumer engagement and rehabilitation program manager for Medell North America, and I am your moderator today. Uh, we are very lucky and uh, I'm very excited to present um, two colleagues of mine who have been very instrumental in um, us creating a story and sharing uh, clinical practice about uh, how to best take care of children who come from uh, homes that do not speak the majority language of their country. I have Dr. Ferenc Bunta. He is Associate Professor at the Department of Communication Sciences and Disorders at University of Houston. He's been very instrumental in um, uh, performing research and, and, and um, describing uh, what's possible for children uh, in, of this population. And then Christina Zarate is a, a Licencia Phonoaudiologia uh, Certified Auditory Verbal Therapist. She's at the Department of Otolaryngology Oncology, Neurolinguistics in the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, Argentina. And it's a pleasure to have her as well. Uh, Christina is, uh, in my view, a pioneer with this population. She um, championed um, serving this population in Houston, Texas with me and was also instrumental in helping document their progress. So it is my pleasure to introduce both of them to you. And um, I will now turn the screen over to Dr. Ferenc to share what we've learned. All right, so can you see my screen? Yes, sir. All right, excellent. So uh, thank you very much for coming. I'll be talking about speech and language production of bilingual children with cochlear implants. And I'm going to talk about some highlights and clinical implications. I'm Ferenc Bunta, and thank you, Michael, for that wonderful introduction. This work was supported in part by a research grant from NIH and IDCD, so I want to acknowledge that. And first, uh, I'm sure you are familiar with uh, what a cochlear implant does, but I'm not sure if you've heard what a cochlear implant simulation sounds like. And in case you haven't, um, here it goes. All right, so obviously having a diminished signal uh, makes speech and language acquisition all the more challenging, especially when you're dealing with children who are exposed to two spoken languages. And my talk will focus on two spoken languages rather than sign language, which is another area of research. So the question is, can bilingual children learn to speak more than one language if they have cochlear implants? And the short answer to that question is yes. We've done studies and my colleagues elsewhere have done studies that demonstrated that indeed bilingual children who learn two spoken languages uh, can uh, produce both um, if they have cochlear implants. More specifically, can bilingual children match the English skills of their monolingual peers who also have hearing loss? And the answer to that question is also yes, with the caveat that if home language is supported, 
So for children who use a language other than English at home, I think home language support is very, very important. Our data show that when you compare the overall language outcomes on a uh, rough uh, language assessment measures, um, monolingual English speaking children who use cochlear implants and the English skills of bilingual children who have cochlear implants are commensurate. What happens uh, when bilingual children with hearing loss receive dual language support as opposed to English only support? Sometimes pediatricians uh, make a recommendation that if a child has hearing loss or any other uh, disorder, um, don't overburden them with uh, additional information like another language. Uh, the problem is that a lot of uh, um, families speak a language other than the majority language at home. And then if you deprive the child from having more language support, that could be detrimental. So our data indicated that bilingual children with hearing loss actually do better when the home language is supported as opposed to children with hearing loss who have English only support. And why? Well, simply because more language is better. When it comes to home language maintenance, bilingual cochlear implant users can maintain their home language if support is provided. However, there are some differences between bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and their peers with normal hearing. There's, for one, there is a more individual, excuse me, more individual variability in the cochlear implant group than their peers with normal hearing. And also there seems to be a difference in the outcomes when the maternal education differs. And this is more prevalent for children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. I'm gonna show you the data right now. This was just published uh, a few months ago. So when you look at cochlear implant users versus children with normal hearing who are bilingual, um, there's a difference in how they maintain their home language. And when you look specifically at maternal education, Maternal education seems to have a bigger impact on the home language maintenance of bilingual children who use cochlear implants as opposed to their peers with normal hearing. More importantly, should spoken bilingualism be supported? And the answer is that if there's family support, then uh, supporting the home language could be very beneficial. And if the language spoken at home, especially if you have speakers, who don't speak the language of the majority. For example, in the US context, if uh, the home language is Spanish uh, and you have speakers who don't speak English, um, it's better to support the home language. That is not to say that uh, children wouldn't also uh, be encouraged to use English uh, in, in any other settings, but supporting the home language can actually pay dividends for both languages. So if the home language is predominantly non-English or in other countries, not the language of the majority, then um, supporting the home language makes sense. And eventually the language of the majority in the case of the US tends to become the stronger language anyway. So when kids enter school, there's usually a shift from more home language to more uh, language of the majority. And in the in case, at least in the US, it seems to be that uh, over time, the children's English skills uh, overtake their home language skills. Now, because of my area of research is really in bilingual speech and phonological development, I'm gonna tell you a few uh, pieces of information about specific speech patterns and what they look like in bilingual children with hearing loss, as opposed to their peers with normal hearing and their monolingual peers. One of the studies that we've done focused on segmental accuracy. Those are measures like percentage of consonants correct, percent vowels correct, and whole word variability. Anna Sosa and I published a paper in 2019 looking at these measures, percent consonants correct, percent vowels correct, and whole word variability. And in this study, we asked the children to go over a word list three times. So basically they went through something like cat, dog, fish, and then they went through the list uh, two more times and then we looked at how variable their productions are, as well as how accurate their speech sound productions are. And we looked at both Spanish and English samples. What we found was that bilingual and monolingual cochlear implant users uh, uh, are able to 
uh, use both languages, but there are differences for obvious reasons. So one of those differences, when you look at the percentage of consonants correct, children with cochlear implants uh, get lower scores uh, overall. So there's an implant effect in that uh, the segmental accuracy specifically for consonants uh, seems to be lower for cochlear implant users. And that is true uh, for their English. However, in our study, we did not find that monolingualism versus bilingualism had an effect on this. As you could see, they're both monolingual and bilingual children uh, with, um, with or without hearing loss could match each other's skills when it comes to the English segmental accuracy. When we look at the English versus the Spanish of the bilingual children, we also find an effect of the device. Children with cochlear implants generally have lower segmental accuracy, as you probably already know. We also found uh, a language effect in that the Spanish productions for both the children with normal hearing and with cochlear implants were more accurate than their English productions. When you look at variability of productions, again, re quick reminder that we're talking about overall word variability. So if a kid says cat one time, tat another time, and at a third time, uh, that would be 100% variable. And if the kid said tat, 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 that would be, even though it may not be correct, it would be not variable. What we found was that children who use cochlear implants are more variable in their productions than their peers with normal hearing. We uh, have found no effect of monolingual versus bilingual, but I think this is an area that needs further inquiry because when you look at the trend, there seems to be some effect. Maybe we need more participants before we can say this for certain. When you look at the Spanish versus the English of the bilingual children, again, there's an effect of the device. Children with normal hearing are less variable in their production, both in their English productions and in their Spanish productions than their peers with cochlear implants. And when you look at the languages, there was actually a language effect in that the English productions of uh, both bilingual cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing were um, more variable than their Spanish productions. Now I'm gonna get really into details about aspects of speech production. Uh, we're, I'm gonna talk about two studies uh, that I've done and, um, and their relevance for uh, potential implications for clinical practice. One was on stop voice onset time and pre-voicing. And in case you don't know, uh, in English and Spanish, we both have voice and voiceless stops, but the timing of those stops in initial stress position differs. It differs in that in English, the values are shifted to longer voice onset times and less pre-voicing. In Spanish, there tends to be more pre-voicing, even uh, spirantization and, and uh, shorter voice onset time values. So it's not as simple as, you know, having a put and but in both languages, those values actually differ, even though there's an analogous contrast, those values differ across the languages. So the question is, um, what happens when bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and their peers with normal hearing acquire these parameters? Now, this is one parameter that the implant can transmit fairly well. So in a study we published in 2016, we looked at voice onset time and pre-voicing in initial stress stops. And we had bilingual children and their peers with normal hearing. This study only included bilingual children. And we looked at the English and the Spanish of these bilingual children. Both groups, both children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and children with normal hearing differentiated their languages. So their Spanish, uh, VOTs and pre-voicing were different than the English ones. And we did not find any statistically significant differences be, uh, between uh, cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing. So bilingual children with and without cochlear implant can learn to differentiate voice onset time and pre-voicing in their languages. And I'm gonna show you the graphs right now. So on the top, you have the English 
And the white bars represent children with normal hearing. The gray bars represent children with uh, hearing loss who use cochlear implants. What you can see is that the two groups, uh, cochlear implant and normal hearing, perform very similarly when it comes to VOT in both English and Spanish, but there is a language-based difference. You could see the differences between the English and the Spanish productions. So children uh, with or without implants have, have a, an awareness and ability to differentiate languages, even if you have a, a transferable or analogous contrast. The story was the same with pre-voicing. If you look at the pre-voicing in English versus Spanish, both children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants and their peers with normal hearing differentiated the two languages, but the two groups didn't differ significantly from each other. Now, what happens when you have uh, uh, sounds that rely more on fine temporal cues, such as fricatives? For example, sounds like s, sh, s as in su and sh as in shu. We studied uh, the English and the Spanish productions of alveolar, like an S as in su, and palatal, like sh as in shu, or ch, the fricative portion of ch as in chu. And in Spanish, there would be examples like sol, like s, and ch as in chango, for example. We had bilingual and monolingual children in this study with uh, normal hearing and with cochlear implants. And the frication duration results were very similar to the voice onset time results, because this is an aspect that relies on raw durational cues that the implant can transmit fairly well. So for frication duration results, and generally what happens is a, a fricative like a S as in su or sh as in shu tends to be about twice as long as the sh portion of ch as in chu. And uh, both groups, actually all four groups, bilingual children, monolingual children, with hearing loss, without hearing loss, were able to differentiate their uh, fricative and affricate depending on duration. And differentiation occurred both in English and in Spanish for the bilingual children. Now, interestingly, when you look at the spectral mean, this is an, uh, an aspect that may not be transmitted as well as like uh, longer and raw duration. So this, the children with hearing loss uh, and children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants sometimes have difficulty differentiating uh, fricative like s as in su and sh as in shu. So overall, our data bore that out. We found that uh, spectral mean frequency was a stronger cue for children with normal hearing as opposed to children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. There was a clearer separation produced by children with normal hearing when we compare them to cochlear implant users. So that is to say that the acoustic distance between alveolar and palatal frication for uh, um, children with cochlear implants is reduced when you compare it to their peers with normal hearing. And I have a few graphs to show you that. So here, what you're looking at is you're looking at the spectral mean of the English s as in su, sh as in shu, and ch as in chu. And what you see there, the red uh, portion represents the s that represents the alveolar fricative. And then the green and purple represent the palatal fricative. What you see in children with normal hearing, there's a pretty clear differentiation between palatal and alveolar fricatives. Now, when you look at children with cochlear implants, what you see is there's significantly more overlap for alveolar and palatal fricatives, as you can see on the image. Now, when you look at the bilingual children only, and on the uh, right, you have cochlear implant users, and on the left, you have children with normal hearing. Well, on my right and my left, as you're looking at the screen, what you see is that children who have hearing loss and use cochlear implants are not able to differentiate alveolar fricatives from palatal fricatives as well as children with normal hearing. And that is true for bilingual children, as you can see on this image. 
So now we get to the good part, uh, the main findings and implications for clinical practice. And some of these data are, are fairly new, so we need to do more studies, obviously, but we can draw some main conclusions here. One of those is that bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants can achieve language skills comparable to their monolingual English-speaking peers who also use cochlear implants. Home language maintenance can be achieved by bilingual cochlear implant users and their peers with normal hearing, but there's a difference in the uh, uh, level of maintenance across the two groups. And of course, maternal education seems to play a role as well. There is definitely a larger variability and that has been very well documented in the literature, whether you look at sounds or word productions. So there's a larger variability in home language maintenance as well uh, for, uh, in the speech of children uh, with cochlear implants as opposed to their peers with normal hearing. And bilingual children with hearing loss who receive support in the home language actually do better in the other language. And that is because providing, simply providing more support in any language will pay dividends for all the languages. Providing a language rich environment at home, regardless of the language has overall benefits for language development, for bilingual children with hearing loss who use cochlear implants. And by the way, that is also true for children with normal hearing. Now, specifically, cochlear implant users show lower segmental accuracy, so their consonants um, are, are not as accurate as their peers with normal hearing. And cochlear implant users have more variable um, uh, segmental productions than their peers with normal hearing, regardless of whether they're monolingual or bilingual. So the cochlear implant signal properties affect uh, speech um, differently. For example, voice onset time that's transmitted fairly well by the device that uh, um, is acquired fairly quickly, but other aspects like spectral resolution may take more time. And that results in unique speech production patterns. So both bilingual and monolingual children who use cochlear implants display less spectral contrast in their speech patterns than their peers with normal hearing. However, bilingualism doesn't seem to exacerbate that difference. The diminished signal provided by the cochlear implant interacts with the two languages differently. And I think this is a very important point. I talked to some of my colleagues uh, uh, internationally and they say that different languages are affected by the nature of the signal in different ways. So you have to be alert to and aware, be aware of language specific effects uh, and you could expect them in, in your clinical practice. And these effects need further inquiry in not only languages like Spanish and English, but for example, tone languages like Mandarin or Cantonese. So further inquiry is needed and, and, um, and more care needs to be taken to, to look at various languages and different aspects of those languages. And I want to acknowledge the National Institutes of Health for their support, Rebecca Gonzalez for her assistance in recruitment and data collection, the Texas Hearing Institute, especially Amy Cantu and Jennifer Wickersburg, the child participants, their parents and teachers, and finally, my friend and colleague Arturo Hernandez and Mario Svirsky for their invaluable input on uh, parts of this presentation. And these are my references. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ferenc, for this revealing information. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but I, I really appreciate um, uh, the information. It's been, it's been very, very helpful to answer lots of questions that many people continue to have and that we've had over the years. You know, is it possible? Um, what happens if we don't support the home language? Um, and then, and, and now, since we know it is possible and we know that we can accelerate learning, um, now it's important to understand what does it look like? Like over time. And so I think this information is really important. And, and, and where are there areas um, of need possibly for future intervention research? You know, maybe intervention research for mothers of less education, or maybe uh, intervention uh, research studies for um, those kiddos that are showing differences in their speech production. Um, 
do you have any uh any any tool any other words of wisdom that you'd like to end with uh maybe for clinicians that are thinking of um starting to assess um their um their kids that come from another language like what what might be a couple things that they would definitely want to put in their their toolkit well what are the things that i would say and it's kind of obvious that you really have to look at uh, the specifics when you're both the children's background and their speech production, because uh, where while there is variability, uh, a lot of the variability is uh, um, could be predicted by both you know the background of the child. So it's really a combination of the background of the child and the characteristics of the input that they get from the implant. So looking at you know what kind of language they use at home, how much language. Uh, uh, what is the landscape of the household. So understanding your client very well, I think is, is, is very informative as to what their productions are. And we're gonna look at, because uh, um, in our studies, we kind of looked at children who were um, more high performing in the languages. So I think we need to look for, for the scientists, you need, we need to look more broadly and we need to look longitudinally over time. The other thing that clinically may be relevant is look at the progress and, and follow what's been developing and what's not developing, because sometimes that tells you where, where the device may be uh, uh, having issues. So for example, if the kids are doing well with temporal cues and then, uh, but they're having difficulty with spectral, uh, like fine spectral cues, for example, they can't differentiate certain vowels or, or fricatives, uh, um, you, you wanna take a note of that and uh, and follow the progress of the child. Excellent, excellent. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, we have a, we do have one question that came up from uh, Maduri Gore. Uh, the question is, why is the vowel area smaller in children with cochlear implants? Uh, we have uh, our findings are F2 of E is higher, but in other vowels lower. Why could this be the case? I love that question. You know why I love it? And, and please send me, and by the way, yes, you can, uh, uh, for the audience, not, not for YouTube, but for the audience, you can make, <laughs> you know, and, and you can find me on the internet. So please send me an email because we are actually looking at vowels now. So uh, the vowel space, it's, it's very interesting because if you don't have good resolution, right? So if you're having different, more difficulty than a, a kid with normal hearing, differentiating uh, in the frequency domain, it's no coincidence that the vowel space, in fact, a colleague of mine uh, who I'm meeting with today, we're looking at specific vowels and the vowel space. So you are absolutely right that uh, there are different cues for vowels. So one, one of those, well, a number of those cues live in the frequency domain, but there's also durational differences. And what we find sometimes, now I'm extrapolating to second language learners, like if there's something more salient about the input, for example, duration, I'm gonna use an English example, for example, eh as in bed and ah as in bad. Well, those differ in the frequency domain, but they're also different in the duration domain. So when you're listening to different vowels, you're actually listening to uh, many different cues. And then whatever is more salient, it becomes more obvious for in, again, we need to do this for children with cochlear implants and we are doing it as we speak. And I would love to continue the conversation, uh, but for the general audience, I will say this, that maybe you'll be surprised that, like, okay, this sounds like the right vowel, but it doesn't exactly sound like it. So because there are not just spectral cues, but durational cues and other cues that differentiate vowels, uh, maybe uh, um, what you have is, is whatever signal you get, you rely on the cues that you get more clearly. So it's not surprising that, you know, if, if, you have, if your bandwidth is not, you know, the, the two formants are not differentiated clearly, well, you're kind of going to get the, uh, uh, you know, the values that you can get, but you can also rely on other cues. So that's why sometimes these patterns that we see in kids who use cochlear implants are just so different because uh, there, are, there are many, many cues and, um, I'm actually making a, a list of those for vowels. So if you're interested to dig deeper, I'd be happy to talk to you because we are looking at that right now. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bunta. Um, we will now have time to uh, move to uh, Christina Zarate, and uh, she's a Licencia Fono Adiologia from the Hospital Italiano de Buenos Aires, Argentina. Uh, welcome, Christina, and I. Um, it is a pleasure to see your face and have you on this program today. So uh, you're welcome to share your slides and begin your presentation. All right. So, um, okay. So my name is Christina Zarate. I'm a certified auditory verbal therapist. And thank you, Michael, for your, for your kind words before. And I'm going to talk about bilingualism and its phenomena. But uh, before that, um, I want to say that I don't have any disclosures to make. And um, just let's make a review of what bilingualism is. So next one, please. Let's go. There you go. So um, bilingualism is the ability to use two language systems for communication. A person that uses um, two languages, but not in equally, uh, imperfectly equally parts. Bilinguals rarely use their language equally in every domain uh, in their social environment, but they use it with different purposes, uh, in different contexts and with different communication partners. So, um, a bilingual person is not two monolinguals in one person, but rather one mind and two languages. Uh, next one. So if we want to talk about spoken bilingualism in hearing impaired children, um, I like to remind what Ellen Road said, the acquisition of two or more spoken languages via the auditory sense so that we can achieve a conversational fluency comprehension, speech, speech production. And um, here, you'll click the next one, Harold. It feels, yeah. The most important factor here is the acoustic accessibility of early auditory exposure uh, to those languages naturally spoken by parents or others who are around the child. And um, next one, she talks about the language of the heart and the anchor language as their emotional emotional support. Um, next one. If we talk about um, if we talk about or we take in, in consideration the time when language is learned, we talked about simultaneous bilingualism. The child learns the first language or L1 and L2 in simultaneous way. The child begins to acquire two or more languages during the first three or four years of life. And the bilingual acquisition is not different from monolingual first language development and leads to the same kind of grammatical competence. And of course, the better, the, the sooner the better. Um, in regards to sequential bilingualism is the, chil the children um, who learned L2 after L1 is established. The onset acquisition of the second language happens between four and 10 years of age. Of age. And of course here, even though uh, the child, go back please, the child uh, might be able to learn L2 after 80 years of age, let's say, the language aspect that is more sensitive to the process is the phonological part of it. So much more than morphosyntactical, semantic or pragmatic system and exposure here is key. And the phonological is the more sensitive one because it's what, is, what will give you uh, a foreign accent like I do, for example. Adult bilingualism, next one, it's um, when um, adult L2 acquisition is after the uh, 12 years of age. And of course you have to, um, to go to cognitive capacities in order to develop that uh, the knowledge system for that language. Next one. If we talk about um, related to competence, to linguistic competence and linguistic developmental level, we have what we call balanced bilingualism, which is, next one. The next one, please. There you go. You have a linguistic competence is similar in both languages. When we talk about dominant bilingualism, the linguistic competence is better in one language, usually in L1, and can shift over time. This is very important. 
Incomplete bilingualism, the structural development of one of the language is not good, needing translations and multiple transfers from L1. While complete bilingualism, the structural, the structural development of both languages is similar, opening the door for fluency, for compet uh, communicative competence. If we talk about advantages, okay, so um, L1, could you hit please, next one? L1 enhances linguistic skills and develops proficiency in L2. Next one will be metalinguistic awareness is what we know about languages and the language. And this is the foundation skill uh, to learn how to read and to write um, because we always have to determine which language we need to interpret and produce. Divert thinking is uh, that ability to come up with many solutions rather than one and it is considered one of the basic elements for mental flexibility and creativity. So also um, research has shown that uh, learning two languages gives you um, expanded capabilities in communication, in thinking, but also culturally. And this is, uh, this is because we are connected with our emotion, is learning about our cultural identity, is uh, emotional benefit, is cultural heritage, which leads us to a broader worldview and social understanding and gives us social sensitivity. Uh, of course, you can, you also need selective attention. Uh, bilinguals are required to focus on just one or two aspects uh, of a talk while suppressing attention to others. So um, using two languages uh, from the beginning, a bilingual has to um, have a constant control of which language they, they have to use at any given moment. Okay, so the next one, please. If we are talking about um, each language, we will say that interact and draws from each other to generate meaningful utterances. When this happens, we get what is referred as bilingual phenomenon. So let's review some of them. Next one, please. Um, this is the silent period. And it is a pre-production stage where the child is exposed to a second language and focuses on listening and understanding. It is a normal way for the child that needs to process language differences. The sooner the better here, of course, because of that critical period. Next one um, that we're gonna uh, go over is what we call one word, one concept. And bilingual acquisition is, um, in this period, in this in initial period, children only develop lexical system from one of those languages. And um, there are three stage models in bilingual language development that um, Volterra talked about a very long time ago. And um, this model is the child, the first one, the child has only one lexical system using words from both languages. Um, so here we can also say that the child have some um, limited memory capability, so um, they don't need to say the same exact word from in one and in the other. So the easier it is, the, they use the easiest one. So let's say in, in Spanish we say arriba, but in English you say up. So it's easier to say up than arriba. So maybe the child, if he is exposed to that, he will say it. The second stage is the distinct lexical system developed, but children still rely on one syntax for both languages. While the third one, the distinct grammatical systems develop, ending up in differentiation of two linguistic systems. Okay. Let's go to the third one. This is transfer. It, uh, it refers to the influence of a first language onto the second one, mostly for sequential learners. It is, it could be phonological, morphological, syntactical, semantic, pragmatic, characteristic of one language that is used in the other language. So let's talk, um, let's talk about the next one, please. The 
morphos the phonological transfer here. So the challenge here for phonological will also include intonation, accent, uh, prosodic features, rhythm, pauses, speed, and uh, is mostly for sequential L2 learners. They try to use the same rules in the second language as they use in the first one. When it's phonological, then learners usually have a foreign accent. For example, they can say shallow instead of yellow, chew instead of shoe. And I'm talking about, in this case, Spanish English, right? Um, next one, a semantic transfer here is Next one is when um, one word is changed into the other language and maybe because they don't know that word in the other language. So I want la pelota, is, I was, is it would be I want the ball or I want a cookie, quiero una cookie. So they use both languages at the same time, making the semantic transfer. Next one. Um, I also brought you some examples for a morphosyntactical transfer. There are many. I just took a few of them. For example, one could be a noun adjective word order where in Spanish adjectives, often um, come after the noun. So I would say pato blanco, but here the child would say duck white instead of white duck. Uh, another one, I took another one, for example, a word order, plural agreements, auxiliary verbs. Let's see here an example, the trees bigs, using a plural in English where it doesn't exist because in Spanish we do uh, use plurals for uh, adjectives or speak you English instead of do you speak English for auxiliary verbs. Prepositions, which is a huge nightmare in all languages. Okay, so next one. You will see some examples here. I'm looking my shoe because in Spanish we don't use looking for, we don't have that preposition. Or I dream with you instead of of you because dream in Spanish it's used with the preposition with and so on and so on. All right, next one. This is another phenomenon. It's called code switching. It is a very characteristic linguistic behavior of bilinguals. It is a skill behavior that people master only after they have good skill in both languages. And um, a bilingual child uh, of about two years of age has the ability to separate uh, both languages and code switch to address different people and according to different situations. I might uh, have, uh, remember Michael, when we, we, we saw children together and the child would address to me in Spanish and he would address uh, uh, to me in, in English. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, we saw this all the time. What is important here to say also is that when you do it, when you are already, uh, when you master both languages, is that you only code switch when the other people who's talking to you already knows both languages too. You don't code switch with somebody who is monolingual. And that is very important. Uh, we don't even think about it. We do it. We <laughs> just do it. Okay. And the code switch, next one, please, could be intrasentential. For example, a toy next to your house or next to the house or intersentential. I need help. Come here. Ven aquí. Give me a hand. So sometimes that, uh, that, uh, um, that sentence intersentential is to make emphasis of what, what I want to say. Okay, next one. Ah, or, and before that, I was just want to say that sometimes with children, the frequency of mixing decreases uh, with the increase of competence, of linguistic competence. Um, L1 attrition. So this is the loss of some of L1 elements to perceive, to produce, to recognize particular rules, lexical items, concepts due to the influence of L2. But in order for the attrition to set in, there has to be an extensive use of L2 in daily life, which extremely reduces the use of L1. Uh, plus, they, uh, there has to be a long time span. And uh, there's traffic between both languages. It's 
next one it's bidirectional so you can see here in all aspects of language how they influence each influence each other so next one if this happens what we have is additive bilingualism the learning of l2 does not interfere with the learning of l1 both are well developed and positive attitude towards L2 triggers its learning. And this is very important. And what I wanna say next is, um, this is not a phenomenon, but it's very important to be mentioned. And it's the 20, 30% rule. Two language cannot reach the same level of development in all areas, unless there is a sufficient exposure for, for both of them to develop. For one language not to overpower the other, if, 30, 70 split, where 70% of the child's working, waking hours is in the minority language, seems ideal. That's about 25 hours a week. While 2080, uh, with only 20% of the minority language, is only the bare minimum, and that's 15 hours a week. So, uh, next one, please. During language learning, children make mistakes. And it's no different for a second language learner. These mistakes are developmental and not language disorders. And this, is, uh, this also applies for hearing impaired children. So, next. It's very important to distinguish between language differences and communication impairment. Um, okay, next. There are some factors to support bilingualism in hearing impaired children. So, okay, you have to click. <laughs> Exposure to rich natural complex model of language. Next. Early ID and use of state-of-the-art technology for incidental exposure for incidental learning. Opportunities to hear native speakers and the use in the language in everyday environments and environments. And here, what is important is the extended family. Yes. Uh, specific instruction for parents of how to foster bilingual development, especially in hearing impaired children. Um, family commitment is not just that I want my child to speak. I have to do something to pursue it. Okay. Excellent speech perception and hearing technology is key. Next. And the evidence that the child's language learning ability for the anchor language is intact. And let's not forget that attention and working memory need to be in place as cognitive processes critical to learning. Okay. So, uh, just review some, uh, to review some of the strategies that we use with parents, it's uh, one parent, one language, time and place where we choose the time and the place where I want the minority or the uh, or L L2 language to use. This is one of the most used one, which is minority language at home. So let's say we speak Spanish, at home we speak Spanish all the time, out there in the community we speak English. Okay, and the, the last one is the, go back please, is yes, is the mixed language policy. And um, parents use here what suits to the topic or the situation, It they go back and forth, which I think these two, the last two are the ones that are more, more used uh, by families, okay. Next. So for a conclusion, hearing impaired kids show the same phenomenon as normal hearing bilingual children. Bilingualism in a hearing impaired child is not different than helping a hearing impaired kid acquire one language. Takes more than the parents desire. Speech perception, early intervention, and no other disabilities, it's important to be in place. And there's one more. Immersion, that's fundamental. Um, Ellen Rhodes says all the time that exposure is key. Next one. There you go. So exposure is key, is fundamental for bilingualism to develop. All right. 
that's all. Next one, thank you very much. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. This is a very informative um, presentation with some very important things for, for us all to consider when we are observing um, dual language learners. It's, you know, no, knowing that the process by which they're becoming bilingual is, is going to help us um, determine how we are going to assess them and especially how they're going to treat them. Uh, knowing um, uh, knowing the advantages of bilingualism keeps our mind on possibility and it gives us language to inspire hope in our families and then and then and motivate them to to work with their children like this and and also knowing what it looks like through the bilingual phenomena it, it helps us to avoid misdiagnosis and um, and uh, propel the children forward and, and so that we can when we see these indicators we can celebrate their success um, I have have a question for you. I, let's see. I, let's see if I have a. It looks like I might have a, a question. I have some some lots of love coming through the chat right now. Um, but uh, what I would like to ask you is, um, what do you say to parents when you see um, the bilingual phenomena occur? Like, what is what is uh, some tips that you might? How, how do you language it to parents when you see it? You know, because sometimes they would. Uh, when, when we were working together, they thought there was something wrong, right? Um, so what, what kind of language do you use in those instances? I, uh, I really talk about uh, what they really are. Uh, I, I just name them so they, they, can be, they can be educated in what it's, it really is and why they happen. And I give them a lot of examples and I always uh, use my kids who are grown up women now, uh, but um, because it's it's kind of relating to that situation, and for parents, it it is very important to uh, to see that what their kid is going through, it's not an isolated uh, item or event or something, but it happens to all families who are bilingual. Great. That's that. That can be very, very encour encouraging. I also am. Um, I'm also. What's coming up in my mind is where Dr. Ferenc, um, uh Bunta said that the the folks with a lower maternal education had less maintenance over time of the home language. And um, I, I think uh, the what came up for me was that 20, 30 percent rule. Like this could be a good base for some some continued parental education. That it there that uh, to avoid um, like a illusory recovery. Where, where we think everything's fine, they've had their early intervention, that maybe those parents need continued education um, over time in addition to their kids. Any words of advice for clinicians uh, 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 who observe phenomenon and uh, any, any tools that you have must have in your in your office that, that you would suggest? The only thing that I would say, it is very important, and we have heard you so many times, Michael, about this, but it is important uh, to, when we assess these children to, uh, so we need to take in consideration dominant language. And we need to take in consideration that we provide them with the tests that are, um, um, that are uh, standardized for that population. And um, we can also do uh, clinical observation, but if we want to measure progress, we need some uh, numbers. So it is important not to consider what I said before, not to consider a communication impairment when really what, what we are seeing is a bilingual phenomenon. Excellent. We have a couple minutes uh, open. We're getting lots of um, love through the chat. If anyone would like to unmute themselves or or pose a question, um, I invite you to do so. Looks like B Bunta, Dr. Bunta, has raised his hand. Yes, I, I um, and, and thank you for a wonderful presentation, Christina. I uh, the only thing I would add is that you have to remember just like monolingual language or anything uh the more you practice your languages you're, the better you are at it so 
it, you, you can have very high skills in more than one language. And you can have very low skills in one language. So it's kind of like, it's like reading, you know, how do you become a better reader? Well, you read more. So with bilingualism, if you, and I'm noticing that, you know, I, I was raised in a bilingual household, but I'm now trilingual. So the languages I don't use get really rusty. So using both languages. So the first point is it doesn't harm the other language if you use one language more. So it's not like a zero sum game, but if you don't use your language, it will deteriorate over time. It's not like riding a bicycle and you get your balance back in two seconds. It's, it's like you don't use, I mean, I'm sure many of you can relate when you don't write in like, you know, uh, um, as much anymore, let's say, in, you know, in English essays, well, all of a sudden, well, wait, I got to go back. Like for me, Hungarian, I, I write most of the stuff in English now, but if I have to compose an official letter in my other languages, it takes me more time. So you really have to stay on top of things. And when you do, it actually helps the other languages as well. Uh, so so just, just a thought. Now, it, I'm not, I don't think it should be mandated in any way like, okay, so, but it's, it's a logical conclusion that when you use your languages, you become better at it and it actually can help support uh, um, each other. Um, uh, yeah. Thank yes, thank you, both of you. Harold, do how much time do we have? I have one question in the chat. I cannot see my clock. I says take your time. Okay, very good. So I have one question in Spanish, um, Christina, and I think it's a really good question um, to address because we would see this all the time. ¿Qué pasa cuando el niño está acudiendo la lenguaje y ve dibujos en inglés y se confunde con el español? Con re ¿Qué recomendación uh, le da a los padres? Okay, so do you want me to answer in Spanish? Uh, the, yeah, um, well, the translation is, it, it sounds like what happens when the child's um, acquiring um, the language, that, like the home language, I'm assuming, and they see pictures in English and they confuse or they um, they say, maybe they say it in Spanish. What what do you say to the parents? Um, I would say that um, it is important for the child to, uh, to understand what is going on. A communicational partner is super important there, but if he's watching cartoons in English and he's saying something in Spanish, I don't see the harm on, on that because it's developing uh, what we talked about before, uh, lexical items or grammatical items in both languages, and sometimes they overlap. So uh, I don't see any harm of it. I would say if mom is worried that he doesn't know how to say blah, blah, blah in Spanish, but he does know how to say it in Spanish, she can also reinforce that. She can also expose, expose him to that language if she wants, if for her it's important for that kid to know that language in that moment. But um, I don't see a problem in that. And also um, many, um, uh, many people have, uh, or many therapists I have seen, um, have noticed when a child says that they, they would reinforce their knowledge of that word in that language and then say, you can also say it like this in English. Um, and, and for bilingual parents, that could be, that could be helpful too. Yeah. But there is, like you said, I, there, there, this is, um, part of that bilingual phenomena. It's something to celebrate and, um, yeah. And, and like you said, create a, a la um, that language partnership between the parent and the child is important. So the child sees that the language is valued and then it's also valuable. And I think if you, if you tell uh, the parent that, that message, if you give that message, um, you are empowering them to use a more complex and expand their language uh, into more um, complex linguistic behaviors and uh, you know, productions for expanding that language for that kid. Yes, and and uh, Dr. Bunta brings in a really important point that is this is a good time for us to shift our use of language and our and our lens of what we're seeing and 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 um, differentiating between confusion versus a cross linguistic um, retrieval uh, of of those items. Would you like to expand on that, Ferent? Sure. To give you. 
concrete example, right? If I'm if I'm really tired or nervous or something, sometimes a, a word, or if I can't recall the word in, in English, a word from another language pops in my head, works the other way too. So from a scientific point of view, you know, that's not really confusion. So it's not like, whoa, I'm, it's, it's more like, okay, something blocked a, a term in one language and another pops in. So, so we need to differentiate uh, uh, the two. I'm not saying there, there couldn't be confusion. I, I, ha I haven't seen much of it, but usually it's like cross language retrieval, like, oh yeah. Or yes. even, even the terms that exist across languages like a truck and a troca, right? So, <laughs> so it's, it's, that's not so much of a concern. Uh, um, and there's, uh, Christina talked a lot about the uh, code switching. So that's an area I think that needs more uh, um, discovery. And one way, if, if someone's really concerned, it's just practicing both languages and maintaining them is it generally assures that you have better skills in both. Yeah, if you let one lag, well, you're going to, uh, that the consequence will be, well, that language will fall behind, if you will. And what we talked before, when we were saying that context is important, so maybe uh, it's um, at home we can use making a recipe in, and we're talking in Spanish and maybe outside in, in school, we are talking about a scientific experiment that we are doing and we use English language. And let's not forget that dominance can al always shift. Absolutely. Thank you so much everyone for uh, uh, Christina and um, Dr. Bunta for your very informative presentations. Um, this is, I'm sure this is helpful. I know I know this work and the, the, the documented literature has been helpful in replicating these results in other institutions. So, um, and I'm and I'm very happy that it's a passion of mine. I can hear and and, and feel the passion in both of you about this topic. Um, it's very important. Um, so, um, just really, uh, I'm so excited that this this conversation continues. Uh, has continued for almost two decades now, you know. So um, our next experts online is cochlear implants in very young children. Uh, we have Dr. Eva Carl Torp uh, from uh, uh, Sweden, I believe. And so uh, we hope you can join us on December 15th, 2021 at three o'clock Central European time uh, for another great uh, series in the experts online program. So thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Thank you all.